you, you can go. Thank you. So, first of all, thank you very much, uh, especially to Mauro Mezzini for inviting me within the Erasmus uh, agreement we have signed by our, our two universities, and also for uh, Marco Pedicini. It's for me an honor and a pleasure to be here in this seminar, uh, giving you some uh, information regarding our last research over grass isomorphism problem and uh, quantum computing. So, uh, as all of you know, I'm sure the problem we are dealing with is how to identify each of the images you can see on the screen each time that this uh, animated GIF is stopping. It is quite clear that the nodes are the same, that the edges are preserved, that we can talk about the adjacency matrix being pre uh, preserved, and at most we can see that as a sort of uh, permutations on the vertices that preserve the adjacency. Uh, this is uh, a very well-known problem on mathematics. For example, we have we can see here in the screen another three graphs, eight nodes each, and all of them belong to the same automorphism group, since there are automorphism with, on the set of edges of all of these graphs. And uh, well, the theme, the big problem is, or the big question to be answered is, given two finite graphs, are they isomorphic? Of course, in the examples we are seeing on the screen, whatever pair are isomorphic. Even beyond this problem, I would like to note that uh, some years ago, 45 years ago, 1966, uh, graph isomorphism was described as a disease among algorithm designers because of the huge importance it takes on the field we are talking about from the perspective of mathematics for computer science to solve the problem and so on. In order to do some history about the problem we are dealing with, 1981, Mackay, an Australian guy, decides design Naughty. Naughty one is one of the best deterministic algorithms solving the problem of graph isomorphism. Uh, later, 1983, Laszlo Babai proposed his first algorithm for graph isomorphism problem and also proved that algorithm in a paper. It can be easily found on the letter letter. And uh, six years ago, uh, Babai claimed that have provided a quasi-polynomial algorithm. It is a really big step, but I haven't written in this slide that the algorithm has been proved. What is quasi-polynomial? It means below exponential, but over polynomial, exactly in the middle of this order you can see on the screen. This problem, as we are going to see, is an NP, let's say, soft problem. It has been proved. It is not an NP complete problem, neither P problem. So for this uh, conference of last Lovabai in Chicago University 2015, this he claimed that he has found a quasi-polynomial algorithm to solve that, but there is no more references about this algorithm. Or at least no people in my group have found any further reference about the uh, actual quasi-polynomial algorithm to solve that problem. That could invite us to think maybe Laszlo could have found any small problem or something like that, since no references on journals, no more references six years later. It sounds a little bit weird at least. OK, so these are, these are the main references from the uh, deterministic point of view. I mean, all of them implemented on a computer when we are dealing with more or less actual problems. OK. Uh, I have taken one of the several and uh, very basic definition from the paper from Mackay and Adolfo Piperno from this country in which I am. 
an isomorphism between two graphs is a rejection between their vertices such that preserves adjacency. An automorphism is an isomorphism from a graph to itself. What am I talking about? Just a permutation in forms of a matrix such that multiplied by the adjacency of one of the graphs provides the adjacency of the other. This is the basic definition. The set of all of all automorphism of a graph form out of G, as we all know. And I have taken this slide in order to point out that maybe the most efficient algorithm for computing whether two graphs are isomorphic or not is due by Mackay and Piperno. Piperno proposed uh, some years ago, if I'm not wrong, in 2014, yeah, just written there, a structure called Thesis over naughty algorithm originally proposed by Mackay that on average can solve the problem in a time square of n, of course, being n, the number of nodes of the graph, on average. But this algorithm has the bottleneck, the wake point, when dealing with a strong regular graphs. When dealing with those graphs, the algorithm takes exponential time. Average time is uh, when we compute the computational complexity, we can choose by default three orders, which is big O order, omega order, and theta order. The big O order is the worst. The omega order is the, 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 the quickest. And the theta order is the one that absolutely determines. So the big O order of Mackay and Piperno is exponential. But on average, dealing with a huge amount of graphs statistically randomly generated, it can solve the isomorphism in square of n time on average. But in the end, as big O order implies, which is the worst case, it is still exponential. Is that clear? Yeah. Yeah, my question was, is the statistical model for generating the Oh, there are some sort of benchmarking randomly generated graphs that are the typical that are used for those algorithms that try to solve the isomorphism. I don't remember which is the name of those sort of uh, benchmark uh, element uh, graphs generated. In fact, I'm going to refer to maybe two or two of the most famous graphs, which are uh, we are going to see in this presentation what I'm talking about. Okay. So thank you. The problem, as I told you, is neither polynomial solvable nor NP complete. And uh, one of the classical uh, information, one of the classical elements to consider when, uh, in order to uh, uh, identify the, the graph isomorphism and characterization, full characterization, it starts, of course, in invariant. What is an invariant? It's just a necessary condition. I mean, every time that uh, uh, a pair of graph is isomorphic, then the invariant should be preserved, should be held, okay? So one of the classical is the characteristic polynomial, which is just the determine, I don't know what to say, determinante, the, the, the determine, uh, yeah, the determinante of the uh, product of the identity times X minus the adjacency matrix and this is true on one direction, which is an invariant, but not on the other direction. For example, we can see this very simple counterexample for the case of the characteristic polynomial when searching for an invariant. I mean, of course, it is true, but on the other way, it is not true. And it is absolutely immediate that these two graphs aren't isomorphic. We have been working over a sort of uh, characteristic matrix of polynomials, in which instead of having this uh, polynomial characteristic, we are working over the uh, matrix form of the adjacent of all the elements deterministic from the, de uh, from the determinant. And we have proved that its computation takes polynomial time and properly identifies some quite hard graphs to be identified 
regarding its isomorphic issue as Johnson graphs. Also, we have proof in our group that uh, the, the tax of ordering what we are going to find, which is uh, the, the, the rows of this characteristic metric of polynomials, can be easily ordered in an amount of time quite good. But this uh, characteristic matrices, uh, matrix sorry, is able to distinguish the example that in which fell the previous notion, which is the characteristic polynomial. Also, it can distinguish these two graphs, eighth nodes. Uh, the matrices are, the, are almost the same with the only difference of the order of the rows. And as far as we are able to give a symbolic order in a polynomial time, the, uh, this invariant works quite well. And even more, these are two of the, let's say, big brothers, big, big guys in terms of identifying when we can deal with uh, uh, isomorphism over graphs. These two graphs are generated from the number of subsets of uh, a set of n elements with uh, subsets of m elements. For example, in the left hand side, we can see the Johnson graph associated with the subsets of two element from a set of five elements. These are the nodes. And there exists an edge each time that the number, the cardinal of the intersection of these sets are one less than the cardinal of whatever. In the end, it doesn't matter. Both graphs, Johnson and Steiner triple systems, are graphs generated from nodes representing number of subsets of n elements over a set of m elements, and the edges are defined whether the intersection set has this number of elements or this other number of elements as a function of the number of elements in the total set. So the polynomial characteristic, the, the, the polynomial characteristic is able to identify properly the Johnson, uh, the Johnson graphs in which, for example, Mackay and Piperno takes exponential time. And I said, I identify. And uh, failure, I mean, the, the contrary fails with Steiner triple system graphs. What are these Steiner triple system graphs? In order to take an idea regarding how important are them, we can see that the American, Mathematic, uh, American Mathematical Society refers a paper devoted just to the study of the STS-19 graphs, okay? And in this paper, I don't know what is the length of that, you can see the reference on the, on the uh, screen, has been identified more than 10,000 10, million different pairs of non-isomorphic graphs, just, just over STS-19, which means that we are talking about more than 100,000 automorphism different, more than 100,000 different automorphism in the STS-19 graphs, okay? Well, up to this point, oh, I don't know. Yep. Well, uh, now I'm starting with the quantum uh, part of the talk, in which we are going to give just one reference regarding what has been done uh, from the supported by quantum computing and what have we done. Well, this is the very basic case of the circular graph for nodes that present, this is the automorphisms of this group, and the adjacency matrix is defined as usual, you can see on the right hand side, it is a non-directed graph, uh, non-out-to-self uh, 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 connections, and from this adjacency graph, uh, in the paper you can see in the screen, 
by meals and one, two, three, I don't know, six or seven more people, they present some quantum invariance in physical review A year 2019. And on those physical invariants, they start from this codification, this encoding of the adjacency matrix of the graph. The encoding is quite straightforward, as you can see in the screen. It is, roughly speaking, the top side over the main diagonal of the adjacency matrix in which we have changed each one by a poly set quantum gate. And zero does mean nothing. And the control point in the top qubit is just for the sake of aesthetic. It doesn't make anything. Okay. And what we can see in the right hand side of the amplitudes and the phases of these states is that we can read on, for example, I don't know whether you see that, but here we are representing the subgraph, the subgraph of including 0, 0, 0, 0, which means the empty subgraph, which has no edges. No edges when 0, 0 and just the node number 4, the same with the node number 3. But here, top right amplitude, you can see that the phase, you, you cannot see the course. Oh, what a pity. So in the four times four matrix, you can see in the right hand side, right bottom on your screen, in the top line, you can see the three elements, first three elements would represent with an angle of Let's suppose we are computing just angle as by default, zero. And the one on the top line, the last on the right, you can see it is P radians. P radians is the effect of the Pauli set uh, uh, cube, uh, gate. Okay. And represent that there is just one edge in that, one edge in that subgroup. And we can keep on reading this matrix in the way I have explained. So until we reach, for example, uh, yep, in the third line, third row from the top, and the one most in the right, we can see that the angle is again zero. But this angle is zero even when the nodes we are considering in these subgraphs are the nodes one because the one zero on the right hand side and on the bottom one one which means one three four the subgraph con containing roads sorry containing nodes one three four has two edges and these two edges correspond to two p radians so what we can see there is exactly the same than in the case in which have zero radians so we are limited in order to compute amount of edges, which are movements of the quantum gates over 2 pi, as usual. So this is the reason for which in our encoding process, we decided to take another gate. Which gate are we going to take? One gate, which is uh, a square root or the square root of a square root of one uh, uh, it's an exponential of 1 over 2 to an integer power. So in this case, for example, we can see here this, which is 0, 0, and 1, 1. So the subgraph containing just nodes 3 and 4, which means the, the, the rotation of P divided by 4. Why is that? I don't know whether you remember. Yeah, sure, you remember. The square root of Z is S and the square root of S is T. What is a T quantum gate? Just rotating over the said angle P over four, okay? So this computes one uh, rotation, one rotation, two rotations here. So we are able to compute what we are dealing with, what we want to compute. And also here, we compute the four rotations, four rotations that correspond 
to the number of edges in the complete subgraph, which is the, the original graph. Okay, so we can see the state of the base of the Hilbert space on the bottom. The amplitudes of all the elements in the, Hil in the, in the Hilbert space base are the same. The amplitude is 1 over 4. That the square is 1 divided by 16. That 16 times, of course, is 1. Yeah. But we are dealing with just the phase. The phase is p over 4, p over 2, which means two rotations, which means two edges, and so on. So now this is the total information that this circuit is providing us with. So, 0, 0, 0, 0 is encoded over here, and the phase is 0. So, the number of P over 4 angles that has been moved is, of course, 0. And this is 1, 1, 2, and so on. And each of these P over 4 angles represents the number of edges in the correspondence of graph. Is it clear? But we are somehow cheating, uh, sorry, cheating. Why are we cheating? We are cheating because this is uh, executed on Quirk quantum simulator. And this is just a quantum simulator. In the real world, we are not able to open the, cat, the, to open the box because the cat will die. In the real world, in, a, in, a, in an actual quantum computing, you can only make the qubits, the register, to collapse. And after collapsing and repeating the experiment several times, we are on condition of getting probabilistic information. So how to deal with that? Because this, on theory, is OK. But on practice, it's not that clear. Well, first of all, in order to properly deal with that, the invariant we propose is given to isomorphic graphs with a node, then exists a rejection in this way, holding that for every node subset, there is a corresponding subset on the other side, such that the corresponding graphs over them meet the same number of edges. It is proved, it is almost immediate to prove that, which is just uh, the, the, the F we are looking for is the rejection on the original definition. And according to that, what we need is how to measure this on real world. Because as I told you, we are teaching, we are cheating, sorry. This is a quantum simulator. Or in order to do that, we are looking into the literature and in particular into the Shor algorithm and some other algorithms that use a couple of well-known quantum circuits as they are the quantum phase estimation and the Fourier quantum Fourier transform and the inverse of quantum Fourier transform. Even more, also in global algorithm, when you don't know a priori what is the number of solution in the non-order data set you are dealing with, you are invited to use the quantum phase estimation circuit. So by means of that quantum phase estimation circuit and just constructing this sort of structure you can see in the screen. What does M1 represent? M1 represent the circuit you have seen, which is just the copy of the upper side of the adjacency symmetrical matrix, changing the one in that adjacency matrix by some quantum gate. A quantum gate fulfilling that the total number of edges in the original graph should be reached by the rotation we made below to twice p, because otherwise you are going to repeat. Okay, so it is quite common to use that, as for example in Grover at the beginning, you know, to get the appropriate dimension for the size of the qubits you are going to put on superposition. So one who have decided that uh, we have encoded M1, as uh, I have said in my previous uh, in my previous part of the presentation, 
we get very valuable information in front of us. What is this valuable information? For example, here. There, you can see on the right hand side also the, let's say, snapshot of the state of the qubits. But now are encoding a quite different thing. What are they encoding? The three first element, these three zeros, represent the number of edges we are dealing with. And the remainder, four elements, represents which are the nodes included there. Let's go more on detail over that. But the real important thing is that over here in the bottom, we've got the valuable information we are interested in, which is the addition of all the elements having zero edges, one edge, two edges, three edges, and four edges. So, I don't know where is my cursor. Yep, it's here. Yeah, this is the information in the bottom right, sorry, in the top right part. Zero, zero, zero stands for zero edges, and zero, one, zero, one stands for no fourth, third, second, and one. And this represents, what is this representing? For example, yep, this. This is the element. And one zero zero one 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 is C four. So two first lines capture seven subgraphs without any edge, since the three elements zero 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 and zero 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 represent exactly all the cases in which we have zero uh, edges. So this is the independence set of our graph. And even more, we can change on the adjacency matrix one per zero and so on. And what we can get at this level is the number of clicks as a subproduct of this algorithm. Of course, in line third and fourth, what we get is the number of subsets with one edge and so on. So we can summarize that in that way. I have just uh, represented those elements of the Hilbert space base having non-zero amplitudes. And these are the elements you can see and the information provided on the part, which is the phase estimation, give us this information, which is 6.2 stands for the number of subgraphs having four edges, which is just one. Which one? The total one. 2525 25 stands for the number of subgraphs with one and two edges. These four, four subgraphs. And this seven stands for the number of subgraphs having zero edges, the set, the, the cardinality of the independent set. Well, this is our invariant. Our invariant can deal properly, for example, with two quite famous graphs, which are the Peterson graph and the pentagonal Prinzen graphs. For them, these are the adjacency matrices. If you want to see they are different, it's easy to see just on the last column, the final elements. And this, Peterson and uh, Pentagon Prims graphs, in order to be encoded, we have to start. How many qubits are we needing? And what is the amplitude of the quantum gates we need? 15 edges require a quantum gate such that 15 rotations will be, will be below twice pi, which means the appropriate qubit gate will be something representing p over one eighth of radiance rotation on set. 
Once the graph has been coded, it is used the oracle that also requires some ancilla qubits to compute that. And then apply the inverse quantum Fourier transform over the estimation qubits. Finally, we have to measure the estimation qubits. These two graphs are not isomorphic. So when we apply our invariant over these two graphs, this is the result we get. If we just look over the results concerning subgraphs having from 15 to 8 edges, they both meet. Brand, but with less edges to 8, they are different. So our invariant, of course, it, it is an invariant and also distinguishes these two, which are, let's say, quite famous two graphs. But it is not as beautiful as uh, we would like to be. It, here we have, for example, a counterexample with seven nodes that meet on what is said by our algorithm, even when they are not clearly isomorphic. And uh, well, this is more or less a summary of what we are doing in our quantum computing group interested on the graph isomorphism problem. Thank you very much for your attention. And this is what we are doing, what we are working over.